Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it, and without further ado, let's go. Four years ago now, when I was 24, my mum died of breast cancer, and as both my grandmothers had also died of it, I saw a specialist for a screening. I found out I had some cells in one of my breasts that could have turned cancerous at any given moment. I was told I had a few options. I could have regular screenings every three or four months until it does develop into cancer. I was told the risk of the cells becoming cancerous was very high due to family history, but it could also potentially never kid turn so I'd just be getting these screenings for no reason. I could get a single mastectomy on the breast with the bad cells, but they'd need to keep an eye on the other one, so I'd still need regular checkups for the other breast. I could get a bilateral mastectomy and remove all of my breast tissue, basically eliminating the risk. I went for the bilateral mastectomy. It was admittedly the most drastic option, but after seeing what cancer did to my mum and grandmothers, I didn't want to risk it. I was warned about scarring, but told it should be fairly minor. It wasn't, and I was left with two huge pink jagged scars on either side of my chest, each about an inch long and half an inch wide, and it caused me to go into a severe depression, where it got to the stage of me not even leaving my flat because I didn't want people to see me, throwing out my mirrors, and getting physically sick looking at myself. I went to a therapist who suggested a plastic surgeon. The therapist said they'd never normally do that but it was clearly something I was struggling with, and I might never get over it, and the therapist could see why I struggle with it. Although I'll admit the therapist did send me to ask about scar reduction. The plastic surgeon suggested a cream, a laser or implants. The cream didn't work, and the laser was both expensive and risky, so I went with the implants. My natural boobs were an F cup, so I went with a slightly smaller DD. Since then my mental health has improved, and I feel a lot better about the way I look. My confidence has gone up, as has my self-esteem. I know I shouldn't put so much into my appearance, but I wasn't exaggerating about these scars. Huge, bright pink, jagged, raised just really awful to look at, and I hated seeing myself, and they are now nicely hidden away and you can barely feel them. Nowadays, I'm 28 years old and working in an office. I'm doing a lot better than I was. My co-worker, Jill, found out I'd had a boob job, but not about the cancer thing, when myself and my friend from years before the mastectomy were planning a holiday, and she made a joke about me going on a plane with my implants, and Jill overheard. By the end of the day, the entire office knew I'd had a boob job, but not why, and half a dozen people confirmed Jill had told them. Over the next few months Jill made many jokes and comments about my chest to co-workers when I was in earshot, at one point saying I had more plastic than Barbie, and calling me fake in two ways. I didn't hear this one myself but a friend in the office told me that Jill had at one point referred to me as a sack of silicone. I don't know what her problem was exactly, but at one point she mentioned the NHS, so I assume Jill thought that I'd got my implants done for free on taxpayer money. I'd gotten the mastectomy on NHS but gone private for therapy and implants. I asked her to stop more than once, but unfortunately the places I'd talked to her were places like the lift and the women's bathroom where there weren't any cameras, and Jill just kept making comments no matter how often I asked her not to. I wouldn't say it was every single day, but I heard at least three comments per week for three months. I hit my breaking point when me, Jill, and a few other co-workers were having lunch. I referred to something as being shallow, and Jill said, you'd know all about being shallow while gesturing to my chest. I snapped. I said, do you know why I have these? A few years ago the doctors found potentially cancerous cells in my breast tissue. I was advised to get a mastectomy, and was left with huge ugly scars on my chest. I went to see a therapist who sent me to a cosmetic surgeon, who advised me to get implants to hide the scars, and I did just so I could look at myself in the mirror without crying. So maybe next time you want to judge someone for having cosmetic surgery, you should ask them why they had it first and feeling like that was a mic drop moment I picked up my food and left. For the rest of the day, 
I had about one-third of my office come up to me and offer support, and the rest tell me that Jill was just joking around and I was being a witch. I replied that Jill was being a witch long before I was. I then got an email from HR saying they wanted to talk to me the following day, and when I called for clarification they mentioned a hostile work environment. Note, this is apparently an American term and holds little weight in England, but it's what was said over the phone. I knew the person who signed off the email and I'd spoken to. Her name was Debbie, and she was Jill's friend in HR, so I was fairly confident on who had reported me. I realized that if this was already being sent to HR, I needed as much ammunition as possible, so I went about collecting my information. As Debbie had dealt with me so far, it was safe to assume she would be the person reviewing the complaint with me, and if that was true I was screwed. However, I vaguely remembered a section on complaints that was in my contract when I first signed with the company. I flicked through the contract, and there was a part in the complaints section that said I was contractually allowed to request a change of reviewer if I felt my allocated reviewer was biased. It was called an impartial overseer. I photocopied the page and highlighted that part. Then I messaged the people who had offered their support over Facebook and said basically, HR have asked to see me. Do any of you remember Jill insulting me to your face, and are you willing to write and sign something saying what you heard and when? Not everyone was willing to help, as Jill is somewhat feared in the office due to her befriending HR and management, but about 20 people were willing to help me. I guessed roughly when I'd asked Jill to stop previously. The four asks over the last few months, some timings were easy to guess as they'd happened on my break or when I'd first arrived at work, and I wrote them all down, along with a rough time of when the lunchroom confrontation happened and a list of names of who was there for the lunchroom confrontation. I got to work slightly early the next morning. I went round everyone who had messaged me, and most of them managed to give me a printed and signed letter. Some didn't manage to write one but NBD. This isn't exact words as there's 16 letters to sum up here but the gist was, my name is their name. I work with Jill last name and op on date, at time, approximately. I spoke with Jill last name, during which she referred to op as quoted insult. I felt this was inappropriate as it directly related to OP's appearance, and am willing to go on record further, to establish that Jill last name has been discussing op in the workplace in the same manner for three months now, causing me discomfort and creating what I feel is a hostile work environment, signed their name. I wound up with about 16 letters, all from different people, and one of them was in the lunchroom for my conversation with Jill. Some even had bullet-pointed lists of everything Jill had said to them about me, or other people. As it turns out Jill has issues with a lot of people's appearances. She apparently made comments about one co-worker's weight and something anti-Semitic about a different co-worker's nose, all of which were put in these letters. There are about 45 people in the office, so while 16 wasn't a majority, it's still a decent amount. The letters weren't hugely long. Most were only a paragraph, but they had all the necessary information. I was asked to come to HR at 10 a.m. I took the letters from co-workers, the photocopy of the page in my contract, and my dates and times in a little folder with me. I got there, and Debbie was the one overseeing the interview. She got up from her desk, ready to lead me into another room. I immediately turned to the other HR worker that was currently there, and said, so is my meeting with you then. Debbie said, no, you're with me. I replied that this wouldn't sit well with me, as my contract states I have a right to an impartial overseer. And as I said this, I took the contract page out of my folder. Debbie read it. I wouldn't let her take the paper when there was a shredder so close by, and said she could be impartial. I replied that I really didn't mean to be a pain, but I had it on good authority that the person on the other end of this complaint is her friend, and my contract does say I'm allowed an impartial overseer. Debbie stomped off to get supervisor. Supervisor asks how I know she can't be impartial, and I tell him that I have it on good authority that the Jill, who was on the other end of this complaint, is a close friend of Debbie. He asked Debbie if this was true, 
to which she only replied, I can be impartial. Supervisor took a deep breath, asked the other HR representative to come with him, and the four of us all went to review the complaint. I thanked them for being so accommodating. I was worried I'd annoyed them. Debbie took out the complaint, and all three of them went through it with me. Debbie looked homicidal the whole time the interview was happening, as she had clearly anticipated firing me, or at least recommending me being fired. The interview went something like this. It took like over half an hour, and they kept asking me the same questions but phrased different ways, so this is a really drastically condensed version. Question. You said outside that you think Jill last name reported you. Why is this? Answer. Jill has had an issue with me for about three months now. Question. Why didn't you come to us when you realized Jill had an issue? Answer. I had no issue with her. Question. What issue does Jill have with you? Answer. Four years ago a specialist identified potentially cancerous cells in my breast tissue. I had surgery to remove my breast tissue, thereby removing the cells and the risk. After the surgery I was left with large scars on my chest. I went to a therapist for low self-esteem and depression. The therapist suggested a plastic surgeon who suggested breast implants to cover my scars. All of this is in my medical history, which you have a copy of in my file, and my full permission to review. Jill found out about my breast implants, but didn't know about the cancer. Jill had a problem with my breast implants, and decided to communicate this problem to our co-workers. Question. Why do you feel this is true? Answer. Here's 16 signed statements all from different co-workers, all testifying that Jill told the entire office I'd had breast implants on the day she found out, and has since made comments about these implants frequently. They have quotes of what Jill said to them about it, and rough dates and times. Question. Rough dates and times. Answer. No one knew this would be escalated to such an extent, so no one really took notes as and when it happened. Question. What event or events do you think directly led to this complaint of harassment? Answer. For me, harassment began when Jill told everyone about my breast implants without my consent. But as to the complaint placed against me, it would probably be what happened at about yesterday in the lunchroom. Jill made a comment about me being shallow while gesturing to my breasts, and I replied by giving her an abridged version of my relevant medical history, and ending with a comment about the importance of getting the full story. There are cameras in the lunchroom, so I'm sure you'll be able to find that conversation. I'll admit I could have handled the situation better, but after three months, I felt I had to put my foot down. Here's a list of names of people who were also present. There were six people at the table, including myself and Jill. One of these people is also in those letters, and has written their account of the conversation and signed it. Question. Had you had a conversation with Jill prior to this regarding her comments about you? Answer. Several, spaced out over the last three months. Each time I communicated to her that I felt uncomfortable and upset with these comments she was making, and would appreciate it if she were to stop. Question. To your knowledge, was Jill made aware of your former cancer at any point in this time? Answer. No, it wasn't mentioned in the conversation with my friend she overheard, and I didn't tell her, because frankly, it's none of her business, and I did not feel the need to detail my medical history to a co-worker in order to avoid further sexual harassment. Supervisor stands up and says, well, I think we're done here. He shakes my hand and sends me back to my desk saying that I'd hear from them after they reviewed the evidence letters, CCTV, medical history and anything they had already, and made a decision on the case. I got back to my desk, pulled up my CV, and prepared to start the job search again. About an hour goes by, then the person who wrote the letter and was there for the lunchroom conversation gets called for a meeting with our. They come back ten-ish minutes later. The other people who were also there for the lunchroom conversation get called one by one, except Jill. All of them are gone for about 10 minutes, then come back, find a co-worker, and say that HR wants to see them. Then the people who wrote letters but weren't there yesterday, are also called one by one, and are each gone for about 10 minutes each, some longer, some shorter. By about 3.30 it looks like everyone who wrote a letter or was there in the lunchroom has been interviewed. Then finally Jill gets called in, 
She's gone for about 30 minutes and comes back fuming. She glares at me while I work, but I ignore her. 4.30ish, Jill gets called into HR again. 5 p.m. rolls around. Everyone is either leaving or getting ready to leave, when Jill storms back into the office. She glares at me the whole time she packs up her desk. She then starts telling anyone who will listen that I got her fired before shoving her way onto the lift. An email comes in from our, my case is closed. A few hours ago, my aunt called my mother about something that happened today. Her pissed off woman voice could be heard across the room. I was curious what happened, worried something bad would happen, as I've never heard her so angry, and asked my mother to put her on speakerphone. The following story she told us is parallel to a situation my mother and I went through when I was very young. Here's how it began. Early this afternoon, aunt, age 52, and her daughter, age 9, went to the store to pick up baking supplies for my cousin to make her first gingerbread house. Cousin had always wanted to make one, and was inspired when I shared photos of the holiday goodies I made. I told her it's more fun to make food from scratch, and they just taste better, and she wanted to give it a try. That was their plan for this weekend. Cousin and aunt went to Dollar Tree for candy since they could get way more for way less. Then their local grocery for the good brand named Stuff. They had most of the ingredients at home, so they didn't need much. Being the holiday season, they were in line for quite a while. Cousin bounced with excitement saying how she couldn't wait to get started on the gingerbread house and make it so cute. There was a white woman in line behind them. My aunt assumed 40-something whose outfit said she could buy anything at full price and still afford her bills for the month. She said with a big smile, your daughter has such pretty hair. One thing about the women in my family, we all have great hair because we take care of it. It's thick, healthy and beautiful, and we take pride in it. We all stopped using relaxers before cousin was even born, so it was 100% pure African-American hair. It's a lot of work but the payoff is worth it. Cousin loves getting her hair styled. Today's style was two twists over her head like a headband, butterfly clips and matching bubble balls around four separate evenly parted twists with flower barrettes on the ends. It was windy where they live, so auntie also gelled her hair down. Aunt thanked the woman for the compliment. Cousin was shy around strangers, and inched forward, feeling uneasy as the woman was not on the six-foot marker on the floor separating them. While Aunt started loading their things onto the conveyor belt, she noticed one of Cousin's flower barrettes fell off and one of her little twists came loose. Aunt told her to pick it up, she has bad knees, so as not to lose it. Cousin bent down to get it and as soon as she stood up, the woman behind grabs her and starts touching her hair. This total stranger put her hands on another stranger's child, especially a black woman's child. Yeah, her obituary would be in the works if it were my kid. When Aunt saw her, she hollered, get your freaking hands off my child. The woman stared at her wide-eyed and didn't stop. She's fine, her hair is just so pretty, I couldn't resist the urge to touch it. Aunt starts taking her earrings off, wasn't her first fight. She said, lady, I do not know you, and I am not above resisting the urge to touch you. She snatched the woman's hand away and threw it aside as it smacked into the conveyor belt. The woman cried out in pain while clutching her hand and yelled, What the hell is wrong with you? Aunt tells her, You don't put your hands on someone else's child. If I did that to your kid, you'd have me arrested. The woman looks at cousin, who is on the verge of tears, and says, I bet your mean mommy beats you at home, doesn't she? You're probably being abused. I can take you away from that pain baby. Cousin began to step back from the woman, smelling the crazy on her, and this broad quickly grabbed her arm by force. Cousin shrieks and aunt backhands the woman clean across the face. The woman just gasped and stared at her like she was crazy. To aunt's credit, she was the right kind of crazy, the kind you don't mess with when it comes to her cubs. Aunt didn't know if someone called a manager or security, or if they were already coming but they did and the two security men restrained my aunt. She's no small lady. The woman immediately started sobbing and told them, Arrest this psycho, she assaulted me when all I did was say her daughter's hair was pretty. Aunt said, You put your hands on my baby, you're lucky I'm not whooping your butt up and down these aisles. The cashier and some shoppers vouched for her, saying she didn't know the woman, 
who just started touching Cousin's hair for no reason. The manager told one of the security guards to stay with the woman while he, aunt, and the other guard went to his office. My aunt told them everything that happened before they checked the CCTV, everything from the woman touching Cousin's hair to untie slapping the taste out of her mouth when she tried to grab Cousin by force. Everything aunt told them was caught on video. The manager asked if Cousin was okay, and she said yes. She was just scared for the other woman because she thought her mom was going to, and I quote, beat the white off that woman and curb stomp her. This made the security guy laugh. He was a black man with a daughter himself, and agreed that his wife would have done the same thing. They went back to the woman and told her aunt was acting out of self-defense for her child. The manager told her that because she grabbed the little girl by force, she was on the hook for first-degree kidnapping charges. This is when the woman started fuming and shouted, It's not my fault this skin pigment-related slur is a horrible mother. And there it was, the infamous word that ended Paula Dean's career and made Dave Chappelle a household name. The manager, the security guards, the shoppers, aunt saw a lot of dropped jaws and heard a lot of shocked gasps. The woman realized what she said and sputtered trying to save face. The manager promptly told her to shut up and asked aunt if she wanted to press charges. She said hell yeah. The security guard who waited with the woman slapped some lovely silver bracelets to go with her outfit and escorted her out the store. She was charged for the attempted kidnapping and hate speech. Aunt's $40 purchase was comped and they went home. No matter how sweet cousin makes her gingerbread house, I'm sure the justice she and aunt got today was even sweeter. So, I'm the son of a police officer, and I usually go on ride-alongs with them once every few years. This time, however, I decided to go on a ride along with one of the officers from the next town over. I've grown up with the typical opinions of cops as a teenager, and then as an adult, ranging from, they are just bullies beating on innocent people, to, holy heck that guy was definitely guilty, all while having minimal information on both kinds of events. In recent years, as I get older, I begin to have a much more moderate opinion, especially after what happened on this ride along. I am not a police officer. I live in Connecticut, and it might surprise people to know that we aren't exactly a state filled with rich people everywhere. There are terrible towns, terrible areas in towns, or just generally terrible people everywhere. This is a story about a terrible area in an otherwise average town. Unfortunately, the crisis involving a certain illegal substance was at its worst by this time. A bit more backstory on this event. This town is known for some of its seasonal events. Like most New England seaside towns, as such we usually get a lot of tourists from out of state or visitors from other parts of the state. This time, however, we got someone who was just petty enough narcissistic enough, arrogant enough, and entitled enough to cause a near-international incident. I was finishing the paperwork I needed to get the ride along, introduced myself to the first officer, and talked with him for a bit while he finished his starting protocols for the day, checking email, checking to see if he's been left any messages, looking into the current recent incidents. All in all, it was like being with my family member again. He told me the day was going to be a little bit longer because a few people he got called to the week before called his number to follow up on an incident. While he was doing this, I offered to pick us up some car-friendly lunch from a sub-place I really loved. Little did I know, I was about to be followed by one of the worst human beings I've ever encountered in my life. I'm wading through this nightmare traffic to get to the sub-shop. Then I decide to just park at my friend's house so I can walk the rest of the way. The town is rather close and easy to walk in. I get to the shop, order their special for the week, get some snacks and drinks then walk out the door and accidentally bump into the nightmare lady. I apologized and asked if she was alright. She told me she was fine with one of the most monotone voices I've ever heard. I thought maybe she didn't get her coffee or something and just got in my car and was about to head back to the station. While I was putting the subs into one bag and reusing an old beverage tray I got from McDonald's to hold the drinks, I see in my rearview mirror the nightmare lady taking pictures of my car with her phone. 
I was a bit dumbfounded about this, and grabbed all the stuff to get going. I didn't feel like doing anything to escalate things on what was pretty much a perfect weather day. I get inside, grab my stuff and walk with the officer to the car he was using. We get in and do the basic login procedures for his system when the perfect weather day turned to dark and dangerous clouds in the form of the nightmare lady. I'm sitting in the passenger side seat when this maniac began smashing her hand on the window and screeching like a banshee about how she's going to expose the web of corrupt police in the country, starting with us. My first thought was this woman had been in a serious accident and was hallucinating because her words were thick with what I thought were slurred tones. It turns out she was just from Norway and had a pretty good grasp of the English language but with a thick accent. We didn't find this out until later. The officer got out of the vehicle and politely asked her to cease her assault on the car. She launched into an even more violent tirade and began to shout how she was going to fix the problems with our country by replacing all the police with volunteers from Europe. This continued for another 30 seconds before she began taking a dozen more pictures. After she was done, she grabbed a handful of dirt and threw it at him. Bad mistake number one for her. He moved in to try and arrest her, but she got away in her car, which was on the other side of the gate. He radioed it in and let people know there might be someone with a head injury driving a certain car and that she was wearing extremely expensive clothing. The plates came back as a rental car and having more pressing issues to deal with. The callback, he asked if someone else could be assigned to look for this woman. We get going and meet up with his callback. He talks with them for a while and informs me of what's happening while he files a report. It wasn't until he looked in his rearview mirror that he noticed something alarming. The same woman who assaulted the car was at the callback's house, asking them questions while she had her phone out, recording everything. This person had no idea what was going on and thought the woman was a reporter, trying to do a case on the uptick in crime in her area. The officer turned on the sirens, spun the car around, and tried to get to her before she could get away. Unfortunately, she got away again by getting lost in traffic. Some people on the road don't think you should pull to the side when emergency vehicles are on sirens and lights, causing problems. For the rest of the day, it was pretty mundane. Until we got back to the station and saw the nightmare lady going ballistic with a reporter by her side. She then saw me and the officer I was with, made a straight shot beeline to me, and began to shout obscenities I never thought possible from another human being. She kept insisting how I assaulted her, and then harmed her in the bathroom of a very public sub shop, listed off a fake name for me, and told the reporter everything with tears down her face, she kept talking about how she was being stalked for weeks by me and my fellow officers as she walked home from work. At this point, the reporter immediately asked me what I had to say to these accusations and when the trial would be. The first words out of my mouth were, I am not a police officer, I never have been and never will be, what is going on? This enraged the nightmare lady. She then pulled out her phone and presented the most painfully edited video I had ever seen in my life. The audio didn't even sound consistent. In one case, I could hear my voice cut, then copy-pasted and repeated three times for the same three words, and I saw the cheesiest filter effect ever being used to show the officer attempting to damage the phone. When all was said and done, she looked like she got me and had the deepest grin I had ever seen in my life. I turned to the reporter and said that not only is everything she said false, but that I have multiple witnesses and numerous videos to prove it. The nightmare lady immediately stepped in front of me and with a straight face said, nothing you have will hold up in court. The police are not trusted and all evidence will be thrown out. You might as well admit to the crime you committed. When I asked what she was talking about, she launched into this whole rant about how the lot cameras were obviously fake and that police are not treated as a trusted source for courts. It was her word and her evidence against mine. Then things got good. The reporter cut her off and stated that not only are the cameras in the lot real and always running, but that the officer who was with me was wearing a body cam. Realizing her massive mistake, 
she attempted to snatch the camera off the officer's body. Big mistake number two. Not only did she manage to grab it and attempt to destroy it by throwing it against the wall, but she then tried to kick him and run away. This went over as well as eating a lead sandwich. She brought her foot up and got it completely trapped by the officer just moving his leg to the side. He then began to arrest her and read her rights. During all of this, she was screaming police brutality, demanding the reporter only show the part of her being pinned down and arrested, and how the reporter had to only release her version of the story. It turns out the nightmare lady was a 19-year-old representative from a non-profit organization based in Norway that tries to offer aid to prisoners who are unjustly imprisoned worldwide. It's a genuinely good organization, and I've donated to them before, but the nightmare lady seems to think she's a big member with huge overreaching authority. Her justification for all of this is that she thought I was a corrupt officer because I didn't hold the door open for her when I left with my hands full. I found out much later on that she unwittingly confessed to the attorney from the non-profit how it was all made up, and she wanted to get her name in the organization so she could take over the local police and fix them. She was the delusional daughter of a rather radical activist from the 1980s in Norway, and was basically a spoiled rich brat who didn't think consequences applied to her. The organization distanced itself from her, and I still donate to them because they do good work. Hey everyone, I've got a story for you about my entitled cousin and his Minecraft antics. This happened a few months ago, and it still makes me shake my head in disbelief. So, I've dropped playing Minecraft a while ago, but my cousin Jake is still obsessed with it. He's always talking about how he's one of the best players on a popular server called Hypixel. Hypixel has a variety of mini-games, and Jake spends countless hours playing and uploading videos of his gameplay. I usually don't talk to Jake much because he's always bragging about his gaming skills. But one day, I decided to check out his YouTube channel. He was always going on about how amazing he was, so I was curious to see if there was any truth to his claims. The first video I watched seemed pretty normal at first. Jake was in the lobby chatting with other players and getting ready to join a game. But as soon as he got into the game, I noticed something was off. He was using a ton of hacks. You name it, speed hacks, flying hacks, aimbots, he had them all. It was like watching a superhero in a world full of regular people. He was dominating every game because of these hacks. It was ridiculous. And the worst part, later in the video, he started complaining about other players cheating. Jake, this guy is definitely hacking. Look at how fast he's moving, such a loser. I couldn't believe the hypocrisy. Here he was, cheating blatantly and then turning around to accuse others of doing the same thing, it was infuriating to watch. I knew I had to do something about it. I decided to use his own video as proof and report him to the server administrators. I gathered all the clips of him using hacks and sent them to the Hypixel support team. It didn't take long for them to review the evidence and ban his account. A few days later, Jake started blowing up everyone's Skype with angry messages, trying to figure out who reported him. Jake. Who the heck reported me to Hypixel? My account got banned and I can't play anymore. I just sat back and watched the chaos unfold. He was messaging everyone, demanding answers. Most of our friends didn't even know what he was talking about, since they weren't into Minecraft as much as he was. Jake. Was it you? Did you report me? This isn't funny. Friend 1. Dude, I have no idea what you're talking about. Friend 2. Seriously, calm down, it's just a game. Jake. It's not just a game, I had so much stuff on that account. He was relentless, but no one owned up to it. He even messaged me, trying to get a confession. Jake. Hey, did you report me to Hypixel? My account got banned, and I know someone from our group did it. Me. I don't know what you're talking about, man. I haven't played Minecraft in ages. Jake. This is serious, I lost everything because of this. It was hard to keep a straight face while messaging him back. He was so convinced that he was untouchable, and now he was facing the consequences of his actions. The fallout from his ban was even more dramatic. He went on rants about how unfair the admins were, 
and how the system was rigged against him. Jake. The admins are biased. They don't ban the real cheaters, just the ones who are good at the game. Friend 3. Maybe you shouldn't have been hacking in the first place. Jake. I wasn't hacking, I was just using mods to enhance my gameplay. Friend 3. Call it what you want but you were still cheating. Jake. You don't understand, everyone does it. I was just better at it than most people. Friend 4. Yeah sure, keep telling yourself that. Jake couldn't handle the criticism. He even tried to create a new account to get back on Hypixel, but the admins were one step ahead and banned his new account within a day. Jake. This is ridiculous, they're targeting me specifically. Friend 2. Or maybe they just don't want cheaters on their server. It was a never-ending cycle of him trying to justify his actions and getting called out by our friends. Eventually, he started playing on less popular servers, but it was clear that his reputation was tarnished. Jake. These new servers suck. Hypixel was the best. Friend 1. Maybe you should try playing without cheats for once. Jake. That's not the point. I was just trying to have fun. Friend 3. At the expense of everyone else, doesn't sound like fun to me. I couldn't help but feel a bit of satisfaction seeing Jake finally face the music. He had always been so arrogant about his gaming skills, and now he was brought down to earth. It was a hard lesson for him, but one that he desperately needed. From that point on, Jake stopped bragging about his Minecraft prowess. He became a lot more humble, and even started playing games more fairly. It was a surprising but welcome change. Jake. I've been playing without hacks lately. It's actually kind of fun. Friend 2. Told you so. It's better when everyone is on a level playing field. Jake. Yeah I guess you're right. In the end, Jake learned his lesson the hard way. It was a roller coaster of emotions for him. But it was necessary. As for me, I went back to enjoying my games without the drama. Watching him go through all that was more entertaining than any game I could play. And that's the story of my entitled cousin Jake and his Minecraft downfall. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences and opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.